coffee first? Are you recording already? Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm a little delirious at this point. All right, we'll start. Why not? My name is Nikki Acosta. I work at Cisco. Spent a lot of time at Rackspace before joining a little startup called MetaCloud. Was there for a whopping three months uh, before we were acquired by Cisco. And uh, as an evangelist, I get, I don't know if it's the it's a pleasure to sit between product and engineering and salespeople. Uh, so I have a good time and I work a lot with product. And I, I really have seen in the schedule in the past few years that the schedule has lacked any kind of real product focus session. It's all about like OpenStack. It's all about you know stuff you do on top of OpenStack, but it was kind of missing that piece in between. So I sent out a tweet saying, hey, does anyone want to do a product management panel? And uh, these are my lucky winners. So I'll let you guys introduce yourself. Go for it, Aaron. Hello, everybody. Is this on? It's not. It is not? Nope. There we go. Ooh. These are the people who build products for exactly. OpenStack. So hello, everybody. Uh, Aaron Delp, Director of Technical Solutions at SolidFire. Uh, kind of the interesting aspect I probably bring to this is we have a product based on OpenStack, but it isn't a product. And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit today. Hi, everyone. My name is Shamal Tahir. I'm from EMC, also CTO. And my day job is a technologist, and I'm also uh, heavily involved in the OpenStack initi community initiatives around uh, product working group and product management lately. So I'll be glad to talk about that a little bit as well. My name is Jim Hasselmeyer. Uh, I'm with EMC. I'm a product manager at EMC. I've been a product manager probably the majority of my career or managed product management. So I've always been very interested in product management. Got involved in OpenStack about two and a half years ago. And my particular area of interest and focus is um, how the product management discipline gets applied to open source kinds of projects. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andre Bearfield. I'm Senior Director of Product at Blue Box Group. Um, so we, uh, I was the first product person at this small company um, and have uh, led the development of the build of our Blue Box Cloud product based on OpenStack. Awesome. Got my coffee. How many product managers do we have in the room? How many people in the room love product managers? <laughs> Are there any salespeople in this room? OK, good. They don't listen to us. They just do it. No, they, they sell stuff we don't have. <laughs> they want a roadmap all the time. They want you to commit to a roadmap. Jeremy knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, they want you on the sales calls. So um, first thing you mentioned, Shamel, was the product working group. And I think this is huge for OpenStack. And I've already heard criticisms. Oh, no, there's a product working group. You guys are trying to drive the roadmap in OpenStack. So can you give us uh, an, an overview of what the product working group is, how it came about, and uh, dispel that rumor if, if, you, if you'd like? Yeah, absolutely. Um so the group actually came about, I think, at OSCON. There was a board of directors meeting, and some people were hanging out after the meeting. And they kind of came about and said, you know what? The integrated release is not a product, and OpenStack is not a product, per se, itself. And so, but it was like, at the same time, how do we instill this discipline of you know, requirements into the ecosystem, et cetera, as well as get the information transparently available to people? So effectively, it was just an idea in OSCON. In Paris, we had a session that was actually called Hidden Influencers where it was like all of us have products are, that are either consuming OpenStack or built in the, or part of the OpenStack ecosystem. But at the same time, um, let's figure out how we can bring this practice into OpenStack. So it was more of an idea of seeing who, if people are interested. We had about 100 people in Paris show up. And we did a collection of you know, who, which companies and which vendors were in the room. And there was about 60% of the OpenStack code base was represented in the room. So in in Vancouver, we've officially formed, and really, it's not about you know driving requirements, saying okay, you will do this, and tossing something over the fence and hoping that it gets done. Um, there's three main things we're trying to drive. Actually, one is collect what the state of each product project is and where the focus areas are. So basically, collecting the feedback from PTL's core teams and getting that into like a master deck, if you will, that people can see and read and access. So it's a sharing information that's already the plan for projects. Uh, the other piece is there's multiple working groups in OpenStack, right? Like the product uh, enterprise working group, telco working group, OPNFE now, et cetera. And it's how do we enable all those groups that have subject matter expertise or spe specific requirements for what they do back to the project teams as well. 
So effectively, the best way to summarize is it, we're, we're a funnel both ways. So we're taking requirements and funneling them, hopefully, to the project, pro, uh, project team so they are aware that the requirements are there. And they can choose. I mean, the PTL still and the core team still controls what the project is doing. But at least there, there's visibility for requirements. And then the next step is what they're doing from a project perspective. How do we get that information back to the users and operators? And understanding that a lot of those requirements are coming from users of those vendors, right? Absolutely, and that, that's the key. I mean, we act, we act as an aggregation point, right? Because we all talk to, we all talk to customers a lot, so we, we can drive a lot of different perspectives into OpenStack from a requirements perspective. Jim, are you involved in that as well? Have you been participating? I've been involved in some of it, and I was at the Hidden Influencers meeting in Paris, and there was a mid-cycle meetup in Palo Alto that VMware hosted where uh, a bunch of people got together and some of that got started. Over the last few weeks, I haven't been as involved as Shamile has been, and um, I, I guess one of the things that, as I've been thinking about the progress that OpenStack has made and the, or, the ecosystem has made and what I see what the product working group has done, I think they've made some extremely significant progress. Um, the perspective that I kind of came into this topic around in terms of how does product management apply to an open source ecosystem was about a year, year and a half ago, I started working with some businesses who had revenue responsibility, they were in a line of business, and they had applications that they were moving into an OpenStack environment. And I saw all the needs that they had from OpenStack as, a, as, an, as an ecosystem and as an infrastructure platform, but they didn't have a way to get those requirements into the OpenStack ecosystem. And then on top of that, their day jobs were so busy and they were under so much pressure they weren't in a position to be a contributor. So they had needs out of the environment, but they didn't have the bandwidth themselves to be able to write, to actually contribute the code that might have solved some of the problems that they had. So as someone who's sort of been fascinated with product management overall, it's what I love to do, fascinated by open source overall and, and OpenStack as I was getting involved in that, I thought, wow, what, what can OpenStack do in order to make that happen? I actually blogged a little bit about it about nine months ago. Randy Bias wrote a kind of a provocative article about six or nine months ago. And I, I, I guess one person's opinion, when I see what the product working group is doing, I think that's exactly the kind of infrastructure and the process, and I don't want to say process because sometimes process comes across as heavy, and I don't, I don't mean to imply that, but it's a, it's a methodology that I think OpenStack really needs, and it's got the right structure in my mind in order to be effective in that regard. Yeah, and, and to add one more point to that, <clears throat> you go back to, gosh, you know, like when Nikki, when you and I were in Portland, however many years ago at, at the conferences, and who was really driving the requirements at the time, right? It was, it was developers, 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 right? And, but as this gets bigger and as this gets to the size and the, the hyper growth of you know, these conferences and the interest in the industry, how do we not necessarily take focus away from the developers by, by any means, but how do you get as much user input from the field, from the real customers that are either interested today and want to drive new features or potential customers coming in that maybe need something that's not there? I mean, that's really, you, you need those additional input channels, and I really think that's where the product working group really came into focus, and that's, we really support it. Andre, do you have a comment on that? I was just about to, but then Aaron said everything I was about to say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So in thinking about, and by the way, there is a roadmap. You presented the roadmap. The group presented the roadmap. So we, there is a roadmap floating around out there. Where can people find that roadmap? Yeah, so uh, we're actually going to publish it to the OpenStack dev mailing list. So hopefully it'll be there and hopefully everyone can access it. And actually it's not the roadmap because we're still starting the process. What we want to show was here's the data we've collected. Here's one way of representing that data. And what we want is feedback actually is are we, are we representing in the right way that's meaningful to people as well. So we have data already, but now we're figuring out like what's, what's the right view, if you and will. And Shamal, you'll tweet that out, right? So if people want to follow you, they can get that That's a good way. idea. Yep. yep. <laughs> yes, I mean yes. <laughs> so how much, did you want to say something, Andre? I was, I was going to just make a tiny comment about the working group. I actually only learned about it after getting here this week. Um, and I attended, had the opportunity to attend a session on Monday. Um, and it's, it's mesmerizing. Um, I had the opportunity in March to go to the Mid Summit Ops uh, Meetup in Philadelphia. Um, and I was just like blown away by the way there's uh, mostly operators there, some developers, and how the conversations continue to revolve around this question of 
how do we get the information that the operators are experiencing, just the operators, to the, to, the, to the developers? And the few developers there are saying, we were wondering, this is a quote, we were wondering what you thought about that. And uh, I just think that's so amazing. Um, and I think that's a great place for product to, to kind of come in. Uh, but I do also think it's a really, really sensitive area, specifically because in most organizations that sell a product, um, uh, someone who's in product management is frequently also the owner of a given product. Um, in this case, that probably is not appropriate. Um, so there's some segmentation of the roles um, where a PTL is actually the pro product owner um, with regard to the projects that are out there. Um, so I think there are some more questions. I'm really excited about the opportunity to be a part of the working group, to kind of figure out how we modify the traditional way that we approach products um, in our individual organizations and apply like those sorts of ideas um, to, to an open source, uh, open source solution. There are arguably many, many more operators out there. So there's, you know, the, how do we balance the needs of operators versus the needs of developers in OpenStack, in the products that we build and in the project itself? <laughs> Sorry. You gotta meet both. You know, it's gotta be, the, the operators need to have things to make their life easier and the, develop, the people who are developing solutions on OpenStack need to have the right tools to be able to develop the solutions that need to be built. Um, in, a, in a role that I had previous to what I had right now, we were basically operating an OpenStack-based public cloud. And so, you know, we use the term a lot, under cloud and over cloud, under cloud being the operators and over cloud being the customers who were developing, who were provisioning infrastructure services and developing solutions. And you got to meet both of them. It's got to be easy to operate and it's got to be easy to use. And that's, that's kind of the bottom line. All right. So the the other thing I was going to add uh, quickly too is this this wrinkle of, you know, what do you do when when OpenStack is uh, a collection of pro projects that you can kind of put into a release, and you could if you want to call that release a product, but then what if you want to build full solutions around that, right? And that's the challenge for for my company comes in where we basically want to make OpenStack easier to consume because at the end of the day it is going to drive in my instance more storage um, but how do I make that and basically bundle all of that up to where I have to match um, a OpenStack release cycle and put that with you know a product release cycle of storage a product release cycle around compute a, a product release cycle around networking and all have Though that come together magically once or twice a year in the right times to make it easy to operate and consume to where it isn't right after you put it out it's obsolete um, and that is probably one of the biggest challenge my company faces is how do you take this you know product and bundle it into other products at the end of the day so you can actually deliver something that that the users want to consume sure um, and and that's that's a significant challenge, you know, and it's it's one of those, there's different challenges there of, of do you put it around a release and around a summit? So you can get some interest in it, that's great, but what if, you know, somebody's hardware comes along and revs mid-year and they stop selling the old stuff and you have no choice, right? And, and so there's all these vectors that kind of come together that yeah, certainly, uh, you know, as a, as a product manager just makes everyone's head spin even more than usual. You're talking about roadmap, 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 you know. When you want to try and lay out all of those the complications and put it on, on a one big roadmap, it's, yeah, we, we ha we've had long meetings where we just kind of throw our hands up and go, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> yeah, and let, let's talk about that for a minute because, you know, with OpenStack's frequent release cycles, you know, just because something is released doesn't mean it's stable, we all know that, you know. Um, if you want to add extra features, you know, how should you do that? Should you write it in extensible fashion? Should you try to get it put into OpenStack first and then consume it back? Like, how do you balance building a stable product that customers are going to pay for, knowing that there's going to be a new release in a couple of months? Like, are, are people unfairly rewarded when they're saying, oh, I have releasing my product three weeks after trunk? Like, what, does that mean anything? Well, so Blue Box, we build, uh, basically deliver private cloud as a service, right? So we build, um, we have our own data centers, we buy the hardware, um, we manage OpenStack on top, of, on top of that hardware, and we deliver 
API endpoints and Horizon dashboard to our customers, right? So we build a bunch of different clouds. We have a bunch of operators who work a bunch. We're a 67 person company, so uh, <laughs> relative to these other companies, you know, it's very different. Um, but one of the things that we have challenged, we have had, uh, we have fought with is how do we approach following the releases, the OpenStack releases. Um, so when we, our first product was released, we, we built on Havana. And we had to stick with Havana. We were going through the process of trying to figure out how to build, deliver stable clouds that customers could depend on. Um, and we actually ended up just leapfrogging Icehouse because we were still in the thick of trying to figure out and solidify uh, an operational cloud that we could deliver over and over and over and over and over again to our customers. Um, we did leapfrog uh, Icehouse and we're now in Juno. Um, and we've made a bunch of operational improvements. We understand a lot more about OpenStack. Um, we understand a lot more about how to upgrade OpenStack in place. It's still not perfect, but we're learning a lot about how to do that. And so what we've determined to do is make sure our customers want cloud services. Um, they like OpenStack, but they don't necessarily require OpenStack. They need to utilize the cloud. And so although there probably are some benefits to following along with Trunk, um, what we actually need to do is provide reliable cloud services and be able to uh, um, continue to extend on a reliable cloud for our customers. And so what w our intention is to do is to deliver additional features and follow as close along as we can to the, to the community as long as the release is stable and the upgrade path is seam as seamless as wherever we are, which is getting better and better. Should customers expect at times instability for that reason? Um, is that is that cloud in general? Like, is is should you just expect that there will be instability? I hope not, but I think <laughs> that um, a lot of customers maybe do experience that, um, and I think that we do have some customers ask us why aren't we on the latest release? Like, I'm sure in July, new customers will say, "What about Kilo? Why not Kilo?" And the point is for us we need to deliver a reliable cloud, and that needs to be the top. It, that needs to be the number one objective, because cloud service is what the customer wants. So, so do you feel like, in that regard, that your products and services, your marketing that you do, is competing with the marketing that the OpenStack Foundation does? That is an incredible question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to refer to the face I'm making on this, on this photo up here. I don't know. Is that a smile? <laughs> what is that? What am I doing up there? Do you guys no. feel that way? Do you feel like there's so much hype around well, OpenStack? I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a balancing act, right? Because on one hand, you need the velocity because you want new features. You want, you want to in engage the community. You want velocity and you want momentum. So you're kind of constantly pushing the envelope. You're, you're developing new features. You're improving existing ones constantly. But that is what you're doing from a open source project perspective. From a product perspective, your, your value proposition, what you're selling and what you're offering is a little different. So I think companies that are providing open stack distributions and solutions are providing their customers an experience that they are be they can stand behind and i think what the open stack community is is you know basically advertising or marketing is the momentum and the uh, community of the project itself yeah Go ahead. you know I, I'm, i've thought about this for about 60 seconds so it's not like i've put deep thought into this over a long period of time but it, your question made me think of the model that if you if you think of the classic jeffrey moore crossing the chasm model in a given group of people that are maybe customers or population that are you know multi-tenant cust or customers of a multi-tenant cloud, there are going to be some that are always in that early adopter stage. They're always going to want the newest, greatest thing, and they're willing to pay the price of getting that newest and greatest thing. Even if they don't know what it means, though. Well, no, I'm. I mean, like, I'm how many people know about everything that's happened? No, I, I'm in. I'm. I'm assuming in this segment that I'm proposing that they do know what it means and they know that it could be unstable and they're willing to live with that be in order to get the new hot thing. And then there are going to be other people that are going to say, no, I want to let it bake, I want to let it age, the I want to make sure, yeah, eh, yeah, the mainstream adopters kind of stuff. And so I think for, a, it would seem to me that for a given, uh, for an organization that's doing a service offering, they need to understand the distribution of that, of their customer base in order to make that decision of, do we err on the side of going aggressive and, and adopting things immediately, or do we let stuff bake and roll it out as it becomes more stable? Yeah, and that, that really comes down to, again, as, as uh, the, the role of product management here, what, who is the user or the, the target audience, right? Because 
uh, kind of Andre's point a little bit too of, of if your user wants the latest and greatest, are they the right user for you and your product to consume? And to, to give you a, a, another example of that, it's, it's much more too than just taking the latest release and all of the projects therein, you know, as we get more and more projects, which projects go into that, which projects get tested. And then also, it, you know, in my instance, it's something as simple as, you know, when we did our first version of, of our reference architecture, we used, you know, Foreman and a bunch of other things like that to stand everything up and get it going because we needed to kind of add that, that bare metal to OpenStack layer and we had to go off and design all of that. Well, when we went to the, do the next revision, the state of that set of tools within the industry was completely different. So then we had to go, it, it wasn't like reuse work, it was go back and start over work. And that was something we never really f factored in. We kind of always thought you get the first one done and that heavy lift is done. And then after that, it's just kind of incremental changes to the cookie cutter template. It wasn't that way. Right. And that is, that is something I've really learned in this ecosystem of not just the OpenStack projects, but, but even the ecosystem around that it's changing so rapidly that sometimes the work and the, the research and the effort and who the users you're trying to reach completely change even in six to nine to 12 months. And I was just going to add, it's going to be interesting, like the, the question was a really good one. It's going to be interesting to see how DEF core or what's called interop now or interoperability impacts the answer in six months from now. Because I think, you know, where we've been pushing, you know, a, a view where the marketing messages might have been misaligned a little bit. Mm -hmm. DEF core, I think, is pushing the same model of we want interoperable OpenStack clouds. We want the functionality to be stable and certain components are required to make you an OpenStack cloud. So it's kind of leveling some of that playing field a little bit. And I think, you know, DEF core is not forward facing. DEF core is actually lagging a little bit on purpose. And look, I think without a doubt, that's probably in, in part to maybe the foundation taking some criticism that it, there was too much going on. And we want to be inclusive, but we need to be able to set direction in order to gain adoption. Is that the foundation's job? Is that what they should be doing? I think they should. I think that's what they should be doing. I mean, we need, to, we need uh, OpenStack needs to have its own opinion. Um, and I think that um, we were talking, Jim and I were talking about this yesterday and I was asking about, you know, what sort of models were used in the past? Like what, how did, how did Linux approach this problem? You know, and Jim said, you know, well, they had Linus, you know, they had, they had a, a, benevolent, a benevolent dictator. So we need the direction. That's going to help us push this thing forward. Um, and I think that um, with the help of more input from, from, from the community users at the end end users, uh, operators and devs actually coming together, which is, is a lot of the work that, that, that Shamil is, is doing, then we can kind of start getting those guiding points. I'm going to take y'all's questions here in a minute. So think of your questions and uh, we can come up and, and grab them. Uh, before we do that, we focused a lot on the problems. What are the solutions? One of the things that you mentioned, Shamil, yesterday, and I think all of us kind of discussed was this concept of a product owner. Can you explain what that, what that means? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's going to be different dimensions, too, because we have products, we have operators, we have the community itself. And I think product owners and product management could be applied to all three areas. But in a nutshell, what we're talking about is, you know, there's product management, which is kind of you delivering a product and kind of building all of the requirements as well as the resource management along that whole path. But then there's also the notion of a product owner. And the product owner is really um, a person who is deciding you know what the value is from what I'm trying to do and what basically is a driving force behind adoption of something in my organization or in my company and then effectively the process of how it's made is de decoupled and eventually the product owner is the one who at the end goes did I get the results I expected and does it meet my requirements so I think that product owner notion is is an important one because by having that focus and clarity of why am I doing something ahead of time and then also having a scorecard or a grading system where you can go back why I did something, did I actually meet why I did it to begin with, is, is what's going to make you know, OpenStack adoptions and deployments more and more successful. So I think you know, that, that I think is why the product owner notion is really important. And others might have different opinions of what a product owner is as well, because I mean, so it's a pretty broad term. Should it be the product manager's role to also be sort of the touch point with the community itself? Should they be, should be the, uh, how do you manage a product and have to interact with the OpenStack community to drive requirements there? Should that be two separate teams or two separate people or two different parts of an organization? 
I think <laughs> I think that um it needs to be at least in the same group of people. And I think that I think the people talking to the customers should represent the customers in the community, right? And maybe all the customers aren't part of the community. I mean, a number of our end users, they would never be at this conference, but they utilize OpenStack to run their businesses. And so understanding what they're doing and bringing that information to the community will help drive the future of OpenStack. So I, I think it needs to be, the same. I see both sides of it, but I think that it's important to have that representation. How are you getting your feedback from customers? I talk to, I have to talk to customers. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Aaron? Because you know you have an interesting product situation. Yeah. So for for us, it, it is very much out there talking to customers all the time. But but what's interesting here a lot of times is it's a conversation starter for us more so than it is an end result at times. Of you know, a, a lot of times, and this is both an advantage and disadvantage at times. But I, I think an advantage to OpenStack is. They'll, we'll kind of come in and go, this is what we have, and this is really designed. We have very specifically designed this to address you know, a, a use case that we feel covers the majority of, of the use cases that are out there right now. We're trying to get as much traction as possible. But at the same time, it, what if it doesn't cover it? You know, how do you take something like this that in, in our way is very flexible, a reference architecture, and you kind of pull out one or two pieces, right? How do you take it and kind of go, oh, you don't want that? Okay, we can pull that out. But as long as it's not like when you're, when you're playing, what's the, what's the game, Jenga, right? You don't pull out the piece where it all comes crashing down, right? But you want some flexibility in it. So w it's this weird balance of offering a product, which is sometimes seen almost as a, you know, opaque or black box of you just buy it or you don't to more of a Jenga model of, of still meeting your needs, but being able to kind of pick and choose a little bit. Modularity, maybe? Absolutely. And, and the open st OpenStack situation, we, s we actually see that more so than any of the other uh, reference architectures that, that we treat as a product in-house, because there is so much modularity and flexibility within OpenStack compared to any of the other things that we do. Absolutely. So we Go ahead. One quick question. I, it took me a minute to think through why, the, why I always had this blank stare on my face. I, had, <laughs> I had segmented a little bit. Because I, I don't remember exactly how I asked the question, but it was about users and community. Should they be separate or, or something along those lines? And, and, and the thought I had is that the users are the community. We're all the community. The question was about product management. Should product management be separate from a function of okay. the teams that are actually contributing back to OpenStack? OK, OK. Got it now. Questions? Yeah, let's take a question. There's, there's Go ahead, a... and I'll repeat it for you. So it was interesting how Andre talked about Linux being, you know, probably one of the things that you could think of as a similar situation. But what I was thinking is probably they will have to do it as fast as we need to do it today. So in that sense, maybe Android is a closer example, where you have mobile apps that are going out, you know, updates coming up, and then you have the Android system updating itself as well. So are there any similarities you can take from there? And So the, the question is, uh, or, or the, first there was a comment about um, the model of Linux and how we're actually moving faster than Linux moved. So what was the second part? Is, is, the, is it closer to an Android model than it is to the Linux model? Is, is Android open source? I mean, I mean yes. Yeah. It is. Yep. But isn't it driven by Google? Well, and uh, I'll add to that. It, the, in at least in in my mind, it's it's a, a certainly valid analogy. Be in the idea of um, all of the different handset manufacturers out there consume whatever kind of Google pushes out as the point release, right? Whatever version is out there, and then all of the manufacturers add a little bit of whatever to it, right? Every version, or I shouldn't say, you know, a lot of the versions that are out there in the Android ecosystem, they're all different in some way, shape, or form, and that's their idea of adding that level of personalization to, to per potentially address their market and stand out and differentiate themselves from all the others. And yeah, the, to, to Andre's point earlier, it might take forever for, I don't know, Samsung to release the, the latest version of whatever and because they have to do the in-house testing. They have to figure out what they're going to add, what they, I wouldn't say remove necessarily, but certainly how do they customize it and produce a stable product. Because um, at the end of the day, if you're going to kick something out that 
you're just trying to follow your core as quickly as possible and it's not stable, it, it doesn't matter. I would like to talk more about that afterwards, for sure. <laughs> Question, oh. sir? So in that scenario, okay, are we saying that the product is actually coming from the handset manufacturer here and that Google is just providing? So, yeah, so, so effectively, I mean, that would be very similar to like an open core type of an open source okay, project. Let repeat real quick, sorry, Tom's for the recording. <laughs> Good call. Yeah. So in that scenario, aren't we just saying that the handset manufacturers are the ones who are producing the product, not necessarily Google. Google's just giving you features, and then the handset manufacturer turns that into a product? Sorry, and what's funny is, like, I, I swear I'm not the Android expert in the room by, by any means. But um, yes and no, because uh, if you look at it, the, you know, the, the, the Google phones, right, still run stock Android with no modifications whatsoever. And, and half of them that are out there, you can probably root them and, and throw on your own, you know, your own effectively trunk or core on top of it and just completely get rid of their customization. So you still have the, the ability to take core, if you will, and put it on top of their infrastructure without a doubt. You know, I, I don't know about, I don't know about the core Android very much at all, sort of, sort of what you were saying, Aaron. But as a Samsung owner and someone who gets Google up or Android updates from Google, from uh, Samsung, it is an interesting analogy because you get the apps on the platform that are updating all the time, right? And you sometimes see complaints where Google has released a version of Android, but the handset manufacturer has taken their what seems like their own sweet time to get it out. And I think that is a good model to draw the delineation between an enabling technology, Android, and the product when the vendor says, we're now taking this enabling technology for whatever reason and testing it and doing whatever, and this is worthy to push it out as a product. Yeah, so when I apply that, that analogy out, right, I'm looking at Rackspace or uh, Bluebox or any of the HP, any of the companies that are wrapping, this, uh, wrapping a, up OpenStack and turning it into a product, they're the ones that, that ultimately people are buying. There are some people who are choosing to buy a reference architecture like the, the Google Nexus line, but that's really, they're going out, they're accepting, hey, there are probably some quirks and some odd things here that I have to throw engineers at to fix. So aren't we essentially saying it's, that's what we're, we've built today, right, with OpenStack? Sure, but I think her question is, how did they build that? And so we're talking about what, do, what can we do to, kind of bring some more, put more walls around how we kind of deliver features and, and get releases and input from the market and deliver those features to our, to our customers and users. So I think her point was, you know, how can we use the data, use their model, and is, is there something we can take from there? And this is where I moderate. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it, it also breaks down in other areas, though, because in the case of Android, yeah, it is open source code, but it is tightly controlled by Google. It doesn't have the open governance that yeah. this project has. And, yeah. and so it's, I don't think it's a rabbit hole we need to follow down. The other thing that breaks down on that is that, uh, you know, when it's time to upgrade your handset, you know, it's a 18, 24 month life cycle and it goes in hopefully the recycle, whereas someone who's investing in a cloud infrastructure is making a massive hardware commitment and they're gonna want to see that hardware commitment continue to be relevant when the next six month cycle comes. So I think that's one of the great challenges that we have as a community is you know now that we've opened up the tent and we've got this big tent with us, how do we try and find an effective way to bring this back down to a manageable size? Because clients want consistency, clients want certifications and other things that come with uh, the expectations of a production yeah, workflow. Yeah, no, I, it's a great point. I would add this uh, uh, quickly. I think you want to add a, a point as well. Think of it, okay, again, handset analogy versus building a cloud infrastructure analogy. Yeah, well, the, the life cycle of it is actually key because if you're going to keep a handset two years, you're not necessarily worried about upgrades as much unless you're one who really wants to tinker. But if you're building a cloud infrastructure that is going to you know, actually depreciate over a number of years, you want something that is upgradable. You want something that you, because chances are you're gonna change at some point in that and you're not gonna necessarily do every release. You might you know, skip a, a one release to make sure it's stable to go on to the next one because you have that, that time horizon on the infrastructure 
it is, you know, that infrastructure needs to have a life cycle. It needs to have a plan in place as opposed to it being kind of disposable and you use it for two years and you're out. And that's not the hardware perspective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was actually going to add, so I think, you know, one, one of the other aspects of your question was what can we learn from that community the way they do things? And so, and I'm glad Big Tent was brought up because this may or may not be a little bit controversial, but oh well, what's the fun if it's not, right? Um, <laughs> in, in the Android market, you can have multiple applications doing the same thing. And what governs what gets adoption what doesn't is is stability and features and stuff so basically I think maybe that's one thing we can learn is you let multiple iterations of a function exist and the one that is meeting user requirements or market requirements are the ones that you let live basically how many of you have a, a, a wish list from OpenStack as product folks what's on your wish lists we'll start on this side what's on your wish list Stable cinder drivers. Yeah. What's on your wish list? Neutron networks. neutron networks. Stable neutron networks. What's on your wish list? Uh, guest, VLAN. guest VLAN tagging. Great one. Who, who else has a wish list? Yes. Convergence and heat. And what do you mean by that? Yeah. It's happening. Yeah, the blueprints. It's a set of blueprints. They've started it already. How many of your companies are contributing back to OpenStack? Leave your hand up if you're contributing to more than three projects. That's impressive. That's really impressive. Speaking of contributions, where do you draw the line between what you keep as IP and what you contribute back? And I've been very vocal about Mirantis because Mirantis doesn't really hold anything back. so. I'm not going to, even though I work for a competitor, Marantis does a great job, has been very vocal about contributing tons of stuff back, creating new projects, that kind of thing. Um, where do you guys draw the line? Um, well, so I don't have it at the product level, right? But but what we do personally is, you know, we obviously offer a, pro offer a product, and what we actually did is we've hired full-time developers in-house, and that's just what they do, right? Our entire mission in life is to go work on those projects. Um, and there is nothing held back in our instance, That's right? Awesome. A everything that is developed goes in, into core. In Shamel? Our I, would, I, I would agree with that because, I mean, we're in similar industries and similar markets as well, right? So, A, I think anything that extends the capability, like in our case, Cinder, anything that expands capabilities and functional functionality and workloads that Cinder can actually uh, apply to. I think we, we are open with that. I mean, we did the consistency group stuff. I know you guys did the QoS stuff originally. And so that's all for a game. I think, but we're in, a, we're in a unique spot here because for us, Cinder is a control plane and our real IP is in the product. Right. And so we're, I mean, I, it's going to be more interesting, I think, when we get to Andre, because then it becomes a question of, you know, it, the product is the cloud. The, th the three letters at the end of my name are similar to the three letters, the same as the th three letters after Shamal, so. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> So from the perspective of the cloud, we do not, we don't have, we're not intending to build and differentiate cloud software um, in the, with any IP. Uh, we, we love OpenStack. We believe in the community and we want to contribute and make it better for everyone. We think that, um, that it should eventually truly become the leading open source cloud operating system. Um, so we're committed to that. That doesn't mean we don't build any IP. Uh, it's just not in the cloud services. We are actually building some um, IP to help service providers manage infrastructure um, and deliver and manage clouds in the data center. But that's a product for data center and service providers. So what are our key takeaways here? You know, we, we talked about a lot of things. Obviously, one key takeaway for me was that the product group is definitely should be something that most folks in this room should probably be involved in. Yep, I agree. So how many of you actually attended any product work group sessions? I'm just curious. Okay, good. About half. So we had we had 70 new product managers in our working session here. So obviously, and yeah, continue to join, please, and, and contribute to that, I think. Thank you. I'm going to do a follow-up to that, and that is if you think about the concept of the meritocracy and how that gets used in the technical side of the contributors in the ecosystem, in my mind, in my opinion, the exact same concept holds in the product management space within OpenStack. So along with the appeal to have product managers in the ecosystem get involved in the product working group and doing the product management discipline, if you will, 
the way to have influence, in my opinion, is get roll up your sleeves, get in with the teams, show that you know your craft, and show that you deliver value to the development teams, and they'll act on that data. I mean, we've all seen it happen in our own jobs and our own organizations. So we got an amen. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think the need for collaboration in, an, in that relationship in an open source model is even greater than in a traditional That's why good project, model. our product managers are hard to find. Uh, key takeaways, I think it's going to be really, really hard, but also think that uh, we have an opportunity to really, con really deliver real value to the OpenStack community. And I think that uh, as many of you who are willing to contribute and be a part of it, the better we'll be in the long term. So please, please join. Yeah, and a uh, final thing I would just say is, you know, in product management, in, in my uh, history here is I've seen two types. There's the pioneers and there's the settlers. And I think we're at a unique point right now where we're still looking for both. Um, you know, this, this isn't mature enough to where it entirely needs to be settled. There's student, still new areas to go blaze trails as well. So more than anything, I would just encourage everyone to just roll up your sleeves, figure out where you want to participate and, and how you can help and, and just go do it. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Thanks.